I got to go to uh, La Brea Tar Pits the other day. I know. Got a really nice tour. And uh, uh, we were being filmed, so it was a bit stressful. But I, I bought a, uh, a cap from their gift shop. And I think it's my favorite thing in the world. Do you wear it forwards or backwards? Oh, forwards, forwards, yeah. No, I'm not having a midlife crisis yet, but uh, I think it's on, the, it's on the horizon. Do I look like I have a midlife crisis when I have Do you wear your cap backwards? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh and I wear shorts and a skateboard. Oh, no, you know, that's a choice. And I look at fossils and I podcast and I play computer games. Am I... That, no, that, that evens out, I think. You know, there's there's plenty of respectable elder people that, that play video games. It's a, it's a medium for everyone to enjoy. And yeah, fossils, definitely. Yeah. At what stage do I become, you know, like ironically cool? Oh, dude, you've been you've been ironically cool for a long time. Do not worry. Know. And the fact that you don't recognize it is is even cooler. Is that what makes it cool? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The second you recognize it, you're gonna be intolerable and we'll no longer be friends. <laughs> I wish my favourite band, The Offspring, would make a song about this or something. Are they good? They're, they're good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are they as good as Aqua? Were you being facetious? Have you, have you really not heard of The Offspring? You've no. heard of it. Come on. Well, sing a song for me. I might recognise it. I know the girlies say, We fly for a white guy. Yeah, okay. I did that one. DMCA. <laughs> I don't think I was in tune enough for the algorithm to figure out that I was. No, that point. Yeah, <laughs> this is gold, Dave. Pure gold. Uh, yeah, totally. Should we talk about uh, more about episode two? We we are talking about Dunkelostius. Oh, cool. Okay. So, uh, welcome back, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good introduction. Episode two point two or something, and yeah, Dunkelostius. Dunkel's bone, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. So this is uh, an enormous placoderm fish uh, from the Devonian period, and it is probably yeah, I mean, one of the most iconic fishes in in the fossil record, just because of its sheer size. And it looks permanently angry because of its giant uh, blades, like uh, tooth like blades, and its uh, and its jaws. Absolutely phenomenal creature. It's, if you don't know what it looks like, that description sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I would not want to be in the water with it. Put it that way. Yeah. So everyone, just search for that online. Find the image. It no, because you're all going to see it on Netflix. Yeah, and and I think it's one of the most. I think your I think your listeners will know Dunkelostius because it is such an icon. But yeah, if you don't uh, search for it, it's it's magnificent. So what were some of the design choices you made with Dunkelostius? Did you have much input into this? Yeah, uh, so I mean, so, so fish is, is uh, purportedly my special subject, so th this felt, felt uh, comfortable compared to, to some of the other animals. Um, but I mean, Dunkelostius is one of those creatures that it, it is so hard to figure out because we just know it from the head, that really famous skull, um, which is, is absolutely terrifying. If, you know, if you Google it, it really is, is terrifying. But the 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 body is not there. We don't have that information. So reconstructing everything from the neck back upwards is is a real struggle. And there have been quite a few reconstructions of this thing over the years. And um, with every new reconstruction comes a new size estimate, uh, new fin shapes, all of that kind of stuff. And really, it was uh, the hydrodynamics that led a lot of the decisions about which body shape to go with, because. One thing that you see throughout history is that to move through a medium like water, you really do have to to conform to some rules. And so the decisions we made were very much based on, um, uh, yes, a lot of the literature that, that had a guess at what these things should look like, but also guided by some of the hydrodynamics. Was this creature able to live and move through water, which is a very thick fluid? You know, it needs a lot of surface area and finage to actually thrust itself through the water. And uh, yeah, so Dunkelofsky is a, a challenge in that respect. It also highlights as well um, quite how uh, rigorous our, our research was because since the, uh, the program has been finished, there's been another paper out that describes a different shape of Dunkelofsky's. They, they looked at the, uh, the orbit of, it, of the thing, compared it to the neck, um, did, some, did some, uh, some work to make it a lot shorter and, and compact and... 
I, this is a really good example of the latest paper isn't always the best one because if you look at that that new, uh, it's been described on on various social media as the chunky donkey. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you, it's very contracted. It looks it looks quite strange. So despite the fact that that's the latest paper out, I'm not entirely convinced that uh, that's an accurate reconstruction purely because the hydrodynamics of such a large animal moving it through the water. Um, just don't sit right with me. So th- this was nice to see actually that our design um, still still uh, fits, still uh, is, is 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 really good in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's really interesting to hear the starting point. I mean, you've got the head, but the thing that matters most is just the laws of physics. You cannot escape those. No, no, and you, yeah, I mean, you see it with uh, you know, it's it's convergent evolution. It, it's that that idea that if you want to fly, for example, having two uh, limbs that you can flap at the side of your body, increasing the surface area, that's the way that you move through air. Likewise, if you're trying to move through water, having fins rather than fingers works, and having a streamlined body works, and having a torpedo-like shape works. So. Yeah, it was it was bearing that in mind, and also bearing in mind the the reconstructions that were out there that really informed the shape. And I then went about this this uh, asset in a slightly different way, this model in a different way. Usually, you start with the skeleton and build outwards, but with this animal, we started with the skin, with the body form of the thing, um, and worked inwards. So, from a very very early stage, we had a good idea about what this thing was shaping up to look like, and we had loads of input. Um, the the other um, the, the producer of the series uh, uh, Gisler was fantastic. He's a marine biologist as well, and, and he had a really good sense of what the hydrodynamics would be as well. We worked together with with various scientists too, just to get that shape right. Um, and yeah, various decisions like having skin on top of that that bony skull and having scars, just like sharks have scars around their gills because that's that's how they mate. They grab each other uh, in the gill area to 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 mate. All of those little tweaks to make it look like a more real animal, an animal that's lived in that environment, um, all fed into the, the design. Yeah, so what, what are some of the coolest details you were able to get into that scene, onto that model? Are the little bits and pieces that you just crafted, you sculpted with your knowledge of hydrodynamics? Is there kind of like a, a, a little tip to a fin or something? Yeah. Some of those tiny details. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, the devil is in the detail, absolutely. If you have a very general shape of a fish, it, it doesn't always look right. So having a tail that looks like a goldfish just doesn't suit Dunkleosteus. Having a, a tail that looks exactly like a shark, and placoderms are probably quite closely related to sharks, doesn't quite fit either. But things like having that that tip to shed vortexes off the off the fins, all of that kind of stuff, absolutely crucial. And we worked quite hard to make it look right for for the size of the animal, the length of the animal, that kind of thing. Um, imagining fluid flowing over the the body and and uh, and having a um, a sense of what the fins should look like. Uh, as for my my favorite detail, the scarring, I think, in that 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 right place was was great, really good. Having flesh around those tooth blades, because the, the temptation with all of these animals, whether it be dinosaurs or Dunkleosteus, is to to cover, uh, sorry, is to have those teeth exposed and and to show off possibly one of the most magnificent features of the animal. So to have a little bit of lip coverage, to have a little bit of flesh around those teeth, just like modern sharks do, like most modern animals do, was really important. So that kind of detail was was really uh, important, I think, to make it feel like a real animal. But it's also behavior as well. So we know that this animal is capable of very uh, high bite forces. And we also know that it could probably open and close its mouth in, in milliseconds. You know, it was it was very powerful uh, lever system that could open and close the mouth. So there is a little moment where it's, uh, it's approaching the ammonoid and, and uh, it's, it's dealing with it in its mouth and it sort of snaps its mouth open for a second to, to suck it into its mouth. It's a you know, suction feeder. So getting those little details in from biomechanical studies, it's a, it's a moment. You know, it's a few frames in the overall story, but it makes it so much more real. So I'm really glad that we had so much control and so much forgiveness from ILM that, that gave us that freedom to, to work with the animators and work with the artists who are designing this thing. There was a lot of feedback back and forth on this particular asset. Right. Did, the, um, did your background in hydrodynamics just work with the uh, Dunkleosteus 
or was it involved in all parts of the scene? Did you work on the hydrodynamics of the aminoids and how they moved and how both interacted? Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, probably our best uh, analog for um, you know thing to look at to to compare am aminoids with today are, are things like nautiloids, the, the nautilus that bobs around, and in in having a different shaped shell and uh, you know a, a slightly different design to that aminoid shell, you have to bear in mind the physics of the thing. ILM are fantastic at, at working out what looks right. The physics look right. Half of the battle is making sure that. The, the animal is embedded in that that uh, that world, and in this case, that world is just water. Um, so having the uh, the siphon core blowing in the right direction and having the tentacles wafting in the right direction, giving those tentacles purpose when they needed to have them. Sorry, I, I shouldn't really be calling them tentacles. I should call them arms. I was going to uh, pick you up. I'm on so that. sorry. I'm so sorry, Dave. Um, so yeah, uh, making sure all of that was correct was was really important, and a lot of people were involved in making sure that they were bobbing in the right way, knowing where the gas was in that, that shell, knowing where the, the midpoint was so that you could get the physics right, the center of gravity, all that kind of thing. Um, a lot of work behind the scenes to get that right. Did ILM take well to that uh, brief? You, you know, you come into work, you're working at ILM, you've been busy doing some superhero film, you get told, right, well, now we're gonna work on a paleo documentary, uh, you come in, you're thinking like, oh, I'm going to get T-Rex or get a raptor. <laughs> you come in and someone's there going, well, today we're going to work on the hydrodynamics of aminoids. So we I don't need speak, to I don't speak right like that, Dave. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop that right there. I don't speak like that. Not nearly as much nasally, but a little bit nasally, fine. No, no, they're, they're, they're brilliant with it. They, I mean, they're so excited to to be designing animals that they've they've never heard of before in some cases. So to you know to to work on Dunclastius and aminoids and that kind of thing was a a challenge and a conversation and th they are um, I, I'm not insulting them here at all but a lot of them are paleo nerds you know they are really into it they are um, you know more than me in some cases they're super interested in the anatomy of these things the fact files that me and you put together they they read those back and forth you know I mean it really was um, an investment on their part um, that, that they were into it yeah absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think they really enjoyed it. I'm sure there were moments where we were saying, oh, the siphon can need to move slightly left and that kind of thing, where like, oh God, I spent hours animating that. I need to redo it. But it was always the case that they were happy to do that because they recognized that there's a certain physics that needs to be get gotten right to, to make the animal look believable in the environment. So quite honestly, I think they quite enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay. What was the importance of Jaws for vertebrate evolution? This, this was a really significant moment because until that point, the uh, uh, fishes had been taking food into their, their, their mouths and they could either filter it out or they could you know, maybe squash it a little bit with the muscles in their, in their mouths. But to have an actual bear trap, to have an actual solid lever system, to have a crushing apparatus in the mouth was really important for processing harder food. And this is in a time where you know you, you've got prey that is starting to to armor itself too. It's that they're they're starting to up their defenses. It was fine when there were just worms and that kind of thing that the predators were eating. That's fine. It's all mushy stuff. But when you start to get shells involved, there's a bit more force that's required, and uh, those muscles attached to a hard, um, as I say, a bear trap essentially is super important for them to feed efficiently. And uh, I think one thing we do really nicely in the series here is that we demonstrate that jaws are not just for feeding. They can once they've once they've evolved, they can be used for all sorts of things. Uh, we, we show a mouth brooding fish that's quite cute, and it's it's because of jaws and the ability to really close your mouth firm uh, that they can protect their offspring. And of course, you know jaws are used in nature by all sorts of animals in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways. Um, so, a really pivotal moment in evolution. We're using our jaws right now. We are speaking with our jaws. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Well, Tom, would you be happy to come back for the introduction to episode three? Yes, it would be my absolute pleasure.